and beautiful country. I mean, you saw, I don't know how many people have been to Rwanda or Africa, but, you know, we really wanted to showcase the, the beauty of the countryside as well, and it's most certainly one of the most incredible and diverse places that I've ever been to. So those two things kind of lit a fire for us. Good question. Okay. Other questions? Questions or comments? Please. How do they get funding for their program? Other than private donations. The question is, how do they get funding for their program other than private donations? Funding. Um, there is no funding. No. They they have some funding from the government um, to make their films, and that's a really good question because they really there is no funding. Um, when we went back on this last trip, it was clear that they had run out. Yeah, we were just there in July, and it, the funding has run out. They've lost their sponsors um, due to financial mismanagement at the festival, and so Hollywood is, is really in trouble. The filmmakers in Rwanda now are actually making films and sending them to international festivals, um, which is wonderful, but not everyone knows how to do that, and they don't really have a lot of classes on development and distribution and outreach to get their films out in the world. Um, and so many people are being trained, but they don't know what to do with their films. They don't know how to get them seen. And so, you know, they need funding for those kinds of workshops as well as funding for, for gear. So yeah, they're in trouble right now. We had a question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, what kind of budget did you guys have? <laughs> That's a good question, Dad. Do you want to <laughs> Uh, it's really difficult to explain to people who've never done this kind of work uh, how difficult it is to make an independent documentary film. Um, and people ask about the budget all the time, but it's almost impossible to give you a good answer about the budget because there's been so much in-kind donation and deferrals to make this happen. So you've got cash expenses, but you've also got the other incalculable expenses that will never be recouped by musicians, uh, 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 <laughs> the advisors. Yeah. Uh, so this type of film, though, if you had to pay for everything, would run anywhere from three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars to make. If you had, to, if you had to pay for everything, plus yeah. plus distribution and marketing and outreach, going to festivals, trying to get it sold. I'd say it's up there. Yes. How long did it take from the beginning to the end? Of we're the still end? going. <laughs> yeah, we're still going. We've uh, we finished production in January of 2010. We started. Uh, it's six years. Six years plus. Um, sorry. Yeah. This movie six years. Six years. And counting. And we just started the distribution process. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> We have a question here. I understand where you say they are right now. Can you describe the changes you saw in the six years on how they used to change? You said that you understand how they are right now, but can you describe the changes that you saw in the filmmakers over those six years? Yeah, their industry has grown quite a bit. We were just there in July, so this is a good time for us to talk about how things are now. Um, they actually call it a film economy now. So just when we were there, the government is starting to realize that there's money to be made in the film industry. And they're having meetings about it, and they're forming some kind of film commission. Um, we just launched a site called rwandafilm.org. It's on our website, which is a site that's going to be kind of like the LinkedIn for Rwandan filmmakers to help them connect with each other and find work. There's a lot more work in the industry right now because international companies are coming in. They've seen films that Rwandans have made. They know that there's talent there. And so their industry has grown quite a bit. And the filmmakers themselves have grown up. I mean, we just saw them a couple weeks ago, and it was incredible. Richmond, you know, is making films full-time now. That's his full-time job, and none of those guys ever thought they could be filmmakers full-time. So they've, they've grown up quite a bit as well. The other change, I guess, is that everyone has lost its major sponsorship. So next year is the 10th anniversary of the Rwandan Film Festival, and 
they're trying to find new sponsors, they're trying to find new funding, you know, the guys that ride on the hilly bus and go out and show those don't, still don't make any money. Um, it's in trouble. We have a question right here. Is there anything you can say about Ayub and Claudine's son, where they are now, what they're doing? Yes, I just saw them all. I'm going to talk about that. Claudine and Ayub's son. Claudine and Ayub's son. Claudine and Ayub's son. There are five of them now. There were there, there's four. There were three when we started, and there was four now. Um, uh, Assad has left for boarding school. He's the oldest. He's 14, and uh, he's home for maybe two months out of the year, and uh, that's a that's a very difficult thing for for IU, but he's also a very proud father, and uh, we we got the chance to work with IU in Uganda on a completely different project um, uh, two weeks ago, and uh, those two weeks that he worked with us were Assad's two weeks at home, and it was it was difficult for IU to, to to see his son growing up at 14. I mean, they sent him off to school pretty early. Uh, my son went with us on that trip, my son who was 17, and he had never been to Africa before, and we pers personally took a day to, to hike up to Ayub's house, which is on the top of Mount Kigali, and we just sat there for two hours in awe of those little boys running around, just happy, healthy, funny little kids. They're beautiful. It's a beautiful family, that is. And Claudine actually has, um, she opened up a bigger boutique. She the boutique has expanded. <laughs> the boutique has expanded, it's grown. It's in the same location, but um, much to Ayub's distress, Ayub's not the boss. <laughs> um, they walled in their compound, so it blocks Ayub's view. He can't sit in his living room and see, see the business district anymore. Um, but it keeps the kids from falling off the cliff. And um, the boutique is now about twice the square footage, so maybe. 30 square feet, <laughs> and it's and it's uh, concrete instead of uh, the uh, steel sheeting that you saw before. And the, and business is booming at the boutique. She's she's doing hair now. They're all. <laughs> <laughs>